what I would like to do is ask Lubna, who's on the ground uh, and also has teams in different places in Israel, Palestine uh, that are covering the story for Middle East Eye. Uh, and if you don't know about Middle East Eye, um, all of us publish there. <laughs> Um, Shear does, I do, and Lubna is the Bureau Chief. So we encourage you to, uh, I'm giving a shout out to Middle East Eye. Um, it's middleeast.net on, online if you want to look um, afterwards. And uh, so what I wanted to do was to ask Lubna to tell us, give, her, give us her impressions of everything that she knows that's going on. Um, it's going to cover a pretty wide a uh, wide area because it's going to deal with what's happening inside Israel and it's going to deal with what's happening in Gaza. Um, and also I, I, I wanted to ask her to sort of summarize how we got to this place from the beginning of the, uh, the tension and the conflict that started with Sheikh uh, Jarrah. So go ahead, Ludna. Yeah, first of all, I, I will give some uh, main points and uh, later you can you know, ask uh, people who are with us also can ask you questions and then we can go more in details. But before I speak, I, I want to say that uh, Palestinian areas here are divided, uh, like West Bank is a separate area uh, surrounded with a wall. Palestinians there have a, a different status. They have a Palestinian ID and a Palestinian and Jordanian passport. Uh, there's checkpoints between West Bank and Jerusalem, where the people in Jerusalem, they were speaking about 250,000 Palestinians in Jerusalem who have a residency, but actually they don't have a citizenship and they're facing mainly eviction, uh, settlements, and etc. cetera. Uh, we have 2 million Palestinians in Gaza who totally uh, in, um, besieged and they are disconnected. The, since uh, the 2000s from other areas of the West Bank um, and they can't come in and out. This is all you know, but this Gaza is a city of Palestine. And we have about 2 million Palestinians inside Israel. Uh, we have been called as uh, Arab Israelis. Uh, Palestinians inside Israel like to call themselves a Palestinian 48. We remain inside Israel since 1948. We are the Palestinians who stayed in, in, in our villages. And in order to stay in our villages, Israel uh, imposed on us to hold an Israeli citizenship. That was the only, it was a condition to, for us to stay in our lands. What's going on today is very significant because Palestinians are uprising in all the areas in Palestine, also in West Bank, also in Jerusalem, and in, in Gaza, we know that, you know, Palestinians under attack um, uh, and the significant things also in Palestinians 48 that like inside Israel that been considered until lately like citizens who are fighting for equal rights with Israel, but they've been neglected uh, by international community. I come back to Jerusalem and we started to cover and to follow the houses that been under eviction in Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood, which is one of the neighborhoods around the old city of Jerusalem. The issue of Sheikh Jarrah began 15 years ago, 27 Palestinian families who originally uh, refugees uh, take these houses back in the 50s as uh, instead of their houses they lost uh, in 48. And they are facing a massive plan of eviction of their houses for in order to give it for uh, settlers who claim that they own the land uh, much uh, like much before the establishment of the state. Uh, in 2008, there were uh, four families who were evicted. And back today, we had this uh, El Kord family and, uh, and the Scafi family and other two families who are under eviction. And in August, there is another four families who were under eviction as well. Uh, the Sheikh Jarrah case wasn't in you, like every week there were protests, uh, but mainly I could feel the vibe of anger of what's going on in Jerusalem in different places. The, the, the struggle of Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood spread to the Aqsa Mosque 
you probably noticed that like uh, there was a struggle also in Damascus Gate in other areas in Jerusalem where the police decided not to allow Palestinians to sit in the stairs of Damascus Gate, which is the main exit of the old city. Um, this is like for me, it wasn't only Sheikh Jarrah, it's a lot of things that have been happening in, in different times that Palestinians felt it can't continue anymore like this. And we find the whole thing is spread to the Palestinian towns inside Israel, Akka, Haifa, Lud, uh, Nazareth. And uh, we find ourselves into a, a mass uh, of demonstrations and uprising in all of historic Palestine. Uh, also in the West Bank, uh, there were uh, 11 Palestinians who uh, were, were killed by the Israeli army. Uh, we had um, dozens of uh, protests uh, in the West Bank in 48. Um, when I say 48, I mean uh, Palestinian towns inside Israel, if it's make you uh, understand more. And of course, in Jerusalem, the, the confrontation over the houses in Sheikh Jarrah continue. Um, I have to say that, like, for me, I'm a journalist, I'm running this office. This is the first time I, I find myself in this situation that all of Palestine is in uprising. All of the Palestinians are out. Usually I have something happening in Gaza and then I cover Gaza and sometimes Jerusalem. But this was very significant. And um, I must say that also I meet with a new generation in Palestine, a fearless generation who is not as scary to pay the price and to protest and they don't have anything to lose. It's just different from the first generation of the Nakba. It's different even from my generation. I meet a 20 years old, 18 years old, 19 years old boys, uh, women who are going out to the streets and they are not ready to accept the, the oppression, to accept to be class B citizens in Israel. You probably, um, aware of the nation law that giving supremacy to Jewish over Palestinians inside Israel. And all of these factors that have been going like a snowball um, that happening, this, I, I would call it um, the silence occupation uh, that's been normalized also in the international community is, is exploding now in the face of, of everyone. Um, I should say also that I feel a lot of hope among Palestinians here that they can make a difference. I don't see this as like ending. I consider this as a turning point in our struggle. Um, I also, one of the things I noticed among my meetings with uh, also Israeli settlers that there is also on the other side, a generation Israeli, yeshiva boys who also raise their head because they have now a representation by uh, Kahanist groups in the Israeli Knesset. Uh, they're going in the streets, they call death for Arabs, none of them were arrested. They uh, attack Palestinians, um, we call it lynching. Um, and this is, this is the situation at the moment, it's uh, tomorrow, there is a general strike in all of historic Palestine. This is the first time since 1936 that Palestinians unite their struggle and going for a general strike. Uh, Lubna, why don't you talk a little bit about what happened at Al-Aqsa? Because I think that really had a, an impact in sort of lighting a fire uh, in the community in terms of the border police uh, entering it, defiling the, uh, the, you know, the holy site and, you know, what happened there? What happened, I was in the Aqsa in the night of all of what happened. And I, I mean, I, I met with the young Palestinians who slept there. In, in the morning, we thought, like Israel said, we will not let the settlers enter the mosque. Uh, so m many just of my friends and colleagues relaxed and, and just thought it will be a calm day because it's a day before uh, like last night, so Ramadan, but after half an hour, uh, hundreds of police and forced armed police entered the Aqsa. And I, 
it's like to look at the scenes and the amount of bombs and gas tears. There were hundreds of Palestinians who were injured. They entered the, the holy, the holy uh, spaces and it was, it's felt like if you look at the footage from that day, you, it's, it's, it's completely look like a war. Um, Israel could prevent that by simply not rock inside the, the Aqsa at that day. Of course, I think Netanyahu, the prime minister, wants this to reach to this level, uh, also because of the election. But it's uh, it's 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 also one of the again. It started from Sheikh Jarrah. It's moved to the Aqsa Mosque, and from the Aqsa Mosque, the Gaza Strip, and then was no way back from all of this. I just want to to add that the scene today is really it's it's shocking. If you come to the Palestinian cities inside Israel. You see endless amount of uh, uh, police, uh, Mr. Um, uh, private forces in everywhere. It's remind people of uh, military time. Uh, there's more than 1,000 people were arrested, Palestinian citizens of Israel. And I, I feel like we are into a new era of, of a new period of time that it would, would going to be very, not easy for Palestinians here. It seems like to me it, it goes back to 1966 or beforehand, where yeah. you had um, you had the um, military. You, you had military rule in the uh, Palestinian communities inside Israel. Um, I assume there were curfews and all sorts of impositions of limitations of rights, um, and there was a uh, there was a case in uh, in Yafo, I think in Ajami or maybe it was just uh, in Yafo, where um, Israeli Jews were trying to show their support for uh, the Palestinians and were uh, you know, chanting slogans like Arabs and Jews will not be enemies. And they were met by, uh, you mentioned this sort of like vigilante uh, groups that are uh, being empowered by the, either by the police or by the internal security ministry um not wearing uniforms not wearing name tags not identifying themselves and so there's this wild crazy mix of you know official police and border police and then you have you talked about Mr. Vim, which we should describe as um israeli jews police who are dressed as uh, palestinians in order to uh, catch uh individual palestinians that they want to arrest and they go into protests among the Palestinian communities dressed as Palestinians and then arrest these people and take them away. So it's a very strange, terrifying uh, experience, I, I would imagine, for uh, Palestinians in these communities. They don't know who is out there. And, and not only that, but at night, I've been reading about uh, the, the, the roving gangs of vigilantes who are uh, sweeping through the streets and looking for Arabs to beat up and uh, trying to uh, violently uh, crash their way into homes and and you know God knows what there's lots of videos of that out there so uh, it's just an especially terrifying time I think for uh, not just for the Palestinians but for Jews as well because there was violence uh, as well by Palestinians so um, it's like every community um, has to is now experiencing. Uh, the Jewish community in these towns is now experiencing something of what Palestinians on the West Bank experience every night when the army comes in and arrests people, um, you know, at 3 a.m. in the morning. Uh, but I wanted to move to Shear now and have Shear talk um, about um, some of these same issues about the uh, this extraordinary tension and conflict and maybe even civil war that's happening that's tearing apart Israeli society at the seams. So, um, Take it from there, sure. Yeah, th thanks for mentioning the fact that the fear is something that is not exclusive to the Palestinian community. I think it's very important what you said, Lubna, about uh, this new development of Palestinian unity, where we see resistance coming from Jerusalem, from the so-called mixed cities like Lod and Aqqa and Yaffa and Haifa. And we see, of course, uh, the people in Gaza rising up, and and in the West Bank, and all at the same time, this is a mirror image of 
uh, but, but an opposite mirror image of what's happening in Israel, where you see the opposite of unity. You see the most divided moment in Israeli history, in, in, this, in Israeli society ever. And of course, people are afraid, but what we see is that Palestinians, despite being afraid, are rising up with, with a, a straight back and uh, fighting back against impossible odds. But we see that the Israelis are acting in, an, a, a, in a panic. One of the reasons that these uh, lynch mobs and pogroms are happening is because the government, the police, the, the authorities are afraid to try to stand between them and their Palestinian victims uh, because then they would uh, maybe lose their ability to govern their own population. But if they allow these lynch mobs to act, they're losing their ability to have a sovereign state. In fact, the Israeli military has deteriorated to a mob-like state, like an angry mob, and soldiers are acting very, very individually and not following orders. As a result of this, you see uh, that the Israeli security forces are stretched very, very thin all, uh, along the different fronts. Just recently, uh, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas said that he's going to cancel the Palestinian elections that have been so anticipated and waited for so long. And this was maybe expected, but it was still very disappointing. And a lot of Palestinians say, well, if he's just going to cancel the elections, and of course, the, the reason for canceling the elections is that the Israeli government said they will, they're not going to allow these elections to take place in Jerusalem, uh, thereby breaking the Oslo agreements. But uh, nevertheless, Palestinians in the West Bank see, well, there is not going to be election. There is no demo democratic or semi-democratic representation for us under any kind of institution. Why do we need the Palestinian Authority anymore? Can you imagine what's going to happen if the Palestinian Authority collapses? If just a lot of people will say it's not worth it for us for maybe a small paycheck that sometimes comes, sometimes not, to continue to be the subcontractors of the Israeli occupation. Will the Israeli military be able to find hundreds of thousands of troops to take over the West Bank and manage it in the same way that was managed until the 90s? I don't think so, but they have no choice because otherwise, what are, what, what's going to happen? Palestinians are able to win their freedom so easily, so the same thing is going to happen in, in Gaza and the same thing is going to happen in Haifa. And this is why you see now the Israeli government, the Israeli public, the Israeli newspapers are speaking in a language of, of doom. They're talking in, uh, out of fear. And I think this violence that we're seeing against Palestinians, this racist violence, is motivated by fear. And um, yeah, Netanyahu, uh, Lubna, you said it very well, Netanyahu started this very, very intentionally. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew it, that he was doing that on the nights of Al-Qadr that are so important for the people praying in Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, and he knew that he, he intentionally expanded the violence from Sheikh Jarrah to also include the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque. And he did that effectively to prevent the opposition from uh, forming a government. But at what cost? You know, if I, if I can say a word or two about what's happening in the Israeli uh, society about this, what kind of other perspectives are within the Israeli society? Like you said, Lubna, the, the Sheikh Jarrah story has been going on for a long time. Even 15 years ago, when there were demonstrations in Sheikh Jarrah, and I participated in those demonstrations, there, I, I didn't feel very happy in those demonstrations because some of the protesters were left Zionists. They didn't come there because they cared about the rights of Palestinians in Sheikh Jarrah. They came to oppose the evictions, the deportation of families from their homes, because they said, if we recognize the right of Jews over property that was lost in the war of 1948, then millions of Palestinian refugees are going to demand the property that they lost in the same war of 1948. So it, it's rational for us to give up uh, uh, all claims on Sheikh Jarrah. Otherwise, will create a dangerous precedent. So this kind of rational Zionist logic is something that has been always very opposed to Netanyahu, right? This is uh, uh, people saying it's better to make some small compromises in the, in the short term in order to maintain a Zionist domination and superiority over the entire territory for as long as possible. Netanyahu has always been a person for the short term and always uh, didn't care very much about 
what kind of price will have to be paid for him to stay in power personally and to get some deal here and there. And I think that's something that um, uh, has has really been a, a mark of his entire very, very long administration. He's now more than 13 years prime minister of Israel. And back in 2002, his wife gave an interview, Sarah Netanyahu, and she said in the interview, if Netanyahu is not going to be the prime minister, we will just leave the country and the country can burn for all I care. And that statement is now being um, re recalled in Israeli media because the country is burning. And because people are saying, well, actually, Netanyahu has overplayed his hand. He doesn't care what the consequences are going to be. He doesn't care if it means that he has to start a war in Gaza and in the West Bank and inside Israel at the same time. He's going to do that because that's what it takes to keep him as the prime minister. But that also could spell a change in the very political system in Israel-Palestine. It could be the end of, an, of apartheid. And that's why a lot of Israelis are very much afraid. Their privileges are at stake. And uh, that that makes these events very interesting, and we should really be following them very closely. But of course, everyone are looking at uh, what's happening in the United States. And uh, I think uh, President Biden proved himself to be surprisingly progressive on many issues. But here, when it comes to Palestine, suddenly yeah, th there seems to be the same old pro-Israeli uh, rhetoric that we're hearing. And maybe, Richard, there's more that you can tell us about what's going on there. Thank you, Shir. Um, that was a great introduction for me to come in. Um, but before I talk about the US, which is an important part of this, um, I wanted to, to expand what we've been talking about because um, it's very uh, not, not mentioned at all or understood the role that um, there's a regional dimension here uh, that we haven't really discussed. And that is that um, several rockets were fired from Lebanon into northern Israel, into uh, the Mediterranean. They didn't land in Israel. And several rockets were fired from Syria into Israel. And not only that, but um, I have an Israeli security source who um, I reported in my blog told me that um, Iran has uh, supplied and this is not news because uh, Viktor Lieberman uh, revealed this a year ago, that uh, Iran has supplied uh, Hamas and Islamic Jihad with cruise missiles for the first time. And these are a much more advanced form of uh, weaponry than the primitive missiles that um, they have been using until now. And that is one of the reasons the Iron Dome is not capable of tracking uh, cruise missiles, or at least it does a much poorer job than it does with the other types of missiles. So that's one of the reasons why so much damage uh, relative was was done uh, to Israel compared to 2014 when Iron Dome was able to um, uh, intercept many of these missiles or they landed uh, in areas which weren't uh, populated and caused no damage. Um, and so, so far, the last I checked, there were 10 Israelis that have been killed um, by by these missiles. So you have uh, Iran, uh, which has its own beef with Israel because Israel has uh, has uh, engaged in sabotage internally inside Iran, assassinating nuclear scientists and uh, and causing major explosions in the Natanz uh, nuclear facility. So Iran has its own agenda here and has been engaged with uh, the uh, Palestinian resistance, uh, military militant resistance in trying to um, retaliate against Israel. So um, this has really been in the background, but I think we need to keep in mind that um, if things get worse, and they always can get worse in the Middle East, um, something like this could really light a match and uh, cause a conflagration that goes throughout the region. Um, but now I'd like to sort of uh, turn back to uh, the foreign uh, element here of uh, what, how the world has reacted to this. And um, I think that uh, almost everyone hopes that if there's no ability internally in Israel to stop this, uh, this may mayhem, that the world, the international bodies, the United Nations, the EU, uh, and, and the US, which um, is Israel's most important ally, would step in in some way. 
uh, and try to stop the, uh, the, the bloodshed. Um, and I'm reminded of what happened in Srebrenica uh, in, in the former Yugoslavia and what happened in Rwanda as the world stood by and refused to intervene for whatever reasons it couldn't, uh, it couldn't organize itself. Uh, it couldn't get the kind of moral cohesion that's necessary to step in and decide to take concrete definitive action to intervene and stop a, uh, a, 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 an atrocity uh, genocide uh, like those two that I mentioned. And I think something like that is happening now. And I think we see the same exact inability to act a sort of moral paralysis that's happening in the United States uh, with Biden. I was reading yesterday night that uh, our UN ambassador, who's supposedly a progressive African-American uh, woman um, for the third time has vetoed uh, UN Security Council resolution proposed by uh, three or four of the members of uh, the Security Council. We are uh, paralyzed um, and we do have some voices in Congress that are calling for action. Uh, we have the squad, we have the uh, progressive sort of caucus in, in, uh, in the house and we have uh, unfortunately just about only Bernie Sanders, um, uh, calling for something that's much more definitive than just kind of the, uh, we're concerned and Israel has the right to self-defense, which is the mantra that we're hearing from uh, Biden himself. Um, but even, even there, I think that progressives are pulling their punches. They're not calling for an end of US uh, military aid to Israel, which is where we should be. Um, until now, we've had Beth, Betty McCollum's uh, uh, legislation, which proposes to condition Israeli uh, U.S. aid to Israel based on it adhering to international law. Her uh, main agenda is to stop the arrest of children, Palestinian children, of whom I think there are 300 uh, in violation of uh, the Geneva Conventions minors. At uh, 300 have been arrested by Israel and are held by Israel. So um, those are this are, are sort of like the tiny baby steps um, getting away from the previous kind of uh, pro-Israel agenda that uh, the House and Congress have uh, followed until now. Um, but I think the direction that things have to go uh, is there has to be this continuing opening, uh, this continuing uh, deterioration of the former consensus, the pro-Israel consensus, the Israel lobby imposed on uh, on the House and the Senate and on the presidency. And I think Biden is reverting to that old uh, sort of consensus. And he's been a pro-Israel warrior going back to 1972 when he was first elected. Um, and as as Ashir said so well, um, I think the progressives were willing to uh, give him a chance and see what he was going to do because he seemed to have a progressive domestic agenda, but I don't think many progressives believed that on uh, Israel, they were going to see anything uh, that would be able to be seen as positive. And unfortunately our worst expectations have been realized. And that's one of the reasons I couldn't vote for him because I knew that this would be uh, the impact. I knew that there would be uh, nothing happening over the next four or eight years if he's in power. Um, and I also knew that when there's a vacuum of leadership in, uh, in the region, everything doesn't stay the same and the status quo doesn't remain the same, but actors come in uh, to play and, um, and have their own agenda. And this is the mess that ends up happening. So um, I'm really depressed and shocked uh, I'm, I shouldn't say shocked because it's what I expected, but I'm still shocked um, at the level of, uh, of bloodshed and the complete inability to take any sort of uh, positive action uh, by, by President Biden. It's just shameful. And, um, and I think that we as Americans, the people who are uh, in the audience here need to pressure our, our, our senators and our congressmen. I did see that um, I believe 32 of the 50 members, Democratic members of the Democratic caucus in the Senate called for a ceasefire. Um, I don't know what the other 22 were thinking. I guess they are waiting to get their marching orders from APAC. 
um, but at least that's some tiny incremental uh, bit of, of movement here. Um, but the problem is that uh, events on the ground move so fast and deteriorate so fast that um, that what we're doing here in the United States is way behind the, the, the curve in terms of what needs to be happening. And we're just completely out of the loop and have no impact. And it's just very sad and depressing, um, I think, here for, for progressives. What, what about apartheid? Because Biden prides pride himself for being uh, opposed to apartheid, uh, or maybe even one of the first in the Democratic Party that spoke openly against apartheid. And then uh, this year, we had the biggest human rights organization in Israel, B'Tselem, and now Human Rights Watch calling Israel an apartheid state, I think very accurately. Um, I also think that when Palestinian organizations already called Israel an apartheid state for years, they were ignored. That's also part of the problem and maybe part of the reason that apartheid uh, exists not just inside the state of Israel, but also in the perception of Israel in the United States. But um, why didn't we see Biden saying that he's going to be uh, hard on apartheid the same way that he was before? Well, I think this goes to the issue of human rights. And um, uh, for some strange reason, people have been talking about uh, Biden's foreign policy as having a human rights dimension. And we see that maybe it will have that in some areas, but um, in Israel, we just see a re total reversion to um, the same old, same old, um, you know, you can go back and look at every major Israeli military operation and there's been total uniformity uh, in the US. We've been willing to supply the weapons when the Israeli military has been running out of weapons when they went to war in, in Lebanon and we immediately shipped the weapons to them. So as far as Israel, there is no human rights agenda. Um, but but the, the positive, there are positive elements here, um, I should say, amidst the uh, catastrophe. And that is, exactly what Shir just said about Human Rights Watch and B'Tselem for the first time ever calling Israel an apartheid state, not just in the West Bank, which is obviously it was, but also calling the Israeli state itself as apartheid. And B'Tselem pointedly said, this is apartheid from the river to the sea. I think that's an extremely important part of this, which is saying that this is one whole system that exists inside of Israel itself and in the West Bank. And it gets to the point that the only possible way to in the long term to resolve this is by having a single unitary state that incorporates all of those areas into one state if there ever is going to be a sort of normality in in israel palestine it has to be uh, a, a state that is going to incorporate all of these people and giving them equal rights that's the only way to go it may take generations to get there hopefully not but um that really is the way to go and i think bds and i think the, the increasing ability to talk about apartheid and even people are now using the term genocide, which used to be kind of almost taboo to talk about. Uh, and people who use this term genocide were seen as kind of outliers, you know, and, and, and people were able to say, um, you know, this is not genocide and that don't compare this to, you know, the N word, um, the Nazis and the Holocaust. I think that we're getting closer and closer to, to doing that. And, and that, in turn, I think exacerbates the, um, the, 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 what we've been talking about here, which is a, an increasing uh, ostracism of Israel and increasing awareness outside of Israel, at least among progressives around the world, that, um, that this is untenable um, and that the direction that it has to go is, is the ones that we've been talking about here. Um, we can no longer, liberal Zionists no longer have any kind of credibility, uh, although they keep trying to put forward their two-state solution. And, um, and you were talking about Sheikh Jarrah and liberal Zionists, uh, uh, Israeli uh, left Zionists. Um, I think that's a, uh, you know, a train that's left the station a long time ago. And it, it, it is collapsing. The Labor Party, you know, barely exists as, as a kind of former center left uh, inside Israeli politics. 
Um, I don't know where this is going. It's it's all very new, but um, the cracks uh, are are massive, and um, we'll have to wait and see what the long term impact is of this inside Israel and also externally and in in the region. If, if I have it's to okay, add, I, I wanted like, to ask okay. Lubna a question. Actually, uh, Lubna, I, I think that this this debate about uh, where things are going. Uh, I'm I'm trying to follow what's happening in the Israeli media now, and I think uh, that if we look at the last couple of years, there was an increase in the number in the representation of Palestinians, especially Palestinians 48, in Israeli media, very slow, and it's still there is very uh, clear discrimination. But now, if you're looking at what's happening in the last couple of days. Uh, there is just no guests, no Palestinian 48 guests being invited to speak on the media. And if they are, the first thing is that the, they're asked, first of all, you have to condemn what uh, Palestinian violence and you have to, uh, um, in, in a very patronizing, aggressive kind of voice. What do you think? Is, is that, does this mean that all of the achievements in the media have been lost? Or... I don't think there was any achievements in the Israeli media. We always played the role in the media that Israel wants us to serve, to be the good Arab, to speak, to, to, to invite Palestinians, Arabs who speak the terminology that Israel wants. We've been always invited to condemn things. We never really had an equal voice in the Israeli media. It probably is a, is a, a fantasy or something is an illusion. I would say now we are in, there is no way in the middle. The, 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 the scene is very clear. It's a black and white. There is no maybe, there's no gray area. There is no illusions about having representation in the Israeli parliament or in the Israeli media. And I think we reached to a place where everything is out. The racism is out, the discrimination is out, the, the hatred of the Arabs inside Israel and the Palestinians is, is out. And here we, it's something else will start and the, you know, nothing hidden anymore under the table. I wanted to also add one dimension that I forgot to uh, talk about and that is the International Criminal Court. Um, they, uh, about four to six months ago, um, they announced that they were uh, starting a formal inquiry uh, into Israeli war crimes that were gonna go back to 2014, which was Operation Protective Edge. And um, they were going to uh, take an, I don't know the time limit that was going to be uh, imposed on this investigation, but the uh, chief prosecutor, uh, um, uh, Ben Suda of the criminal court made a very interesting statement about a week ago. And she said, we're watching, we are watching these developments. It doesn't seem to have had any impact on Israel itself. Israel continued to uh, massively uh, destroy uh, um, the uh, AP and Al Jazeera media offices. And then they yesterday destroyed the home of Yahya uh, Sinwar, the uh, head of of Hamas, um, but I think it's very important to add this dimension that the ICC could uh, at some point in the future actually file formal charges against Israel. There could be a, a formal trial in The Hague. Uh, there could be indictments of, of Israeli leaders who are sitting in power like Netanyahu or uh, like uh, Kohadi, who is the uh, chief of staff. Um, these people could have international criminal indictments against them. So um, I want to add Richard, that. I think there's a very big impact of the ICC uh, de decision to open the investigation with the attack that we're seeing now, absolutely. Because you have to see it from the Israeli point of view to understand why uh, the um, Israeli attack on Gaza is actually a response to the ICC in many ways. You see, uh, the ICC made very strong arguments and uh, the, the the accusations are very severe and also very well documented. And from the beginning, the Israeli government made it very clear they have no defense against those accusations. There is no attempt by the Israeli government to say, oh, we haven't committed war crimes. No, the only thing is to say the ICC has no jurisdiction because Palestine doesn't count as a state. 
and uh, the ICC is biased or the ICC, uh, we don't recognize its uh, um, authority and we refuse to sign the, the Rome Statute of the ICC. These are the only arguments. And with these arguments, Netanyahu could try to convince his voters that he can protect soldiers from being indicted and arrested. And then nothing happened because the ICC dragged its feet for so long. And I think that is something that didn't didn't uh, uh, go here or there. A lot of Israelis are wondering, so is it over with the ICC or is it still going to happen? And is it, is it going to happen next week? And because Netanyahu needs some kind of result, he wants to say, look, we can do whatever we want and there are no consequences. That is the only way that he could convince the public that the ICC is not able to affect Israelis in any way. Then he has to actually commit war crimes. So there is, so it's not a coincidence. There are war crimes being committed. There are very lethal attacks on purely civilian areas in the Gaza Strip. And there are shocking and, and horrifying pictures of uh, children being killed by Israeli bombs. And the Israeli soldiers who are com committing those crimes know, or at least they are being told by the government, you have nothing to worry about. Yeah, I think that uh, I agree uh, that, that basically Netanyahu is is telling the world that uh, we we don't give it. I don't know if I could say this, but we don't give a uh, uh, about the ICC. We don't give a about what anybody cares. Um, but the fact of the matter is that the world does have a lot of uh, could have a lot of power and impact here, especially the United States. As I mentioned, we we give. $3.8 billion, mostly in military aid to Israel over a 10 year period. This was negotiated by the liberal progressive President Obama, uh, who is trying to get Netanyahu to tone down his opposition to the Iran nuclear deal. So he gave this 10 year $40 billion deal to Israel. We could just turn off that spigot um, and that would have a huge impact inside of Israel. Um, and, and we could tell Israel that we're not going to uh, supply, uh, you know, we're not going to continue the military uh, alliances, the military cooperation that's created weaponry like uh, Iron Dome. And um, that would have a huge impact because we are the major, most powerful ally that they have and they need us. Um, and they, they pretend that they don't need us, but I think that, that they really do. But uh, unfortunately, we may never know uh, what kind of, th this is a theoretical statement that I'm making, but uh, I think that practically it, it could happen um, and hope that it will happen eventually, but apparently not, not yet. I think we have also to consider the, the growth of solidarity in the streets for, with the Palestinian case. I mean, from one side, we see the different, uh, you know, uh, presidents like Biden, who is he, 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 who in fact can stop the war, but he's not. He's giving Israel all the time to punish Hamas and the number of people who are being killed every day is rising. But in alongside with the fact that leaders are being ignorant for what's going on with the Palestinians, we're seeing, we we're witnessing a growth of solidarity with uh, uh, among people in different countries in the international community. We've seen 150,000 uh, people in London yesterday, in Paris, in San Francisco. I heard also about big marches. And I think this, the, the, you know, the, the, the protest and the uprising of the Palestinian alongside with the courage, with a little bit more courage of the international com community can make a big difference for Palestinian liberation and freedom. Yeah, here in Seattle, uh, which is a relatively uh, small community uh, compared to other major cities, but we had uh, nearly 5,000 people uh, protesting yesterday and marching uh, for, uh, for Palestine. And uh, a few days earlier, there were rallies, pro-Israel rallies in different cities, and there were 40 people protesting uh, in Bellevue in, in favor of Israel. So. I think that the fact that we put we brought out 5000 people compared to the 40 that they were able to bring out um, is is an indication of where the sentiment lies and in the streets. Uh, if even if in the halls of power, um, we haven't yet been able to make enough of a dent 
Um, and I think that's an indication of where the direction that things will go. Um, the streets start first, uh, the sentiment there um, has a gradual impact of working its way from the bottom up to the top. And I think this development of the squad and uh, now about 10 members of the squad elected to the house who take these positions that are far outside of the previous uh, sort of moderate de democratic pro-Israel um, uh, agenda. I think that's all pretty hopeful. I just hope that things don't deteriorate so badly that um, by the time they have a major, are able to have a major impact that it will be, it will be too late. Maybe we There's should an try interesting to- interesting connection yeah. between the two things that we just mentioned, uh, the, the military aid to Israel and the protests on the street and public opinion and the tension between them. So Richard, I actually don't quite agree with the way that you've presented the US military aid to Israel because the memorandum of understanding that Obama signed with Netanyahu for $38 billion over 10 years, was actually not an increase, but a decrease in military aid to Israel, uh, because you have to take into account inflation. Uh, and in fact, uh, that was very pointed out by the Israeli arms industries, which said, uh, you know, this the, there was a clause in the US-Israeli arms uh, agreement that allowed Israeli companies to make use of some of the aid money to uh, sell their own goods to the Israeli government. So it was a, a subsidy to the Israeli arms industry but Obama canceled it and made sure that all of the money goes only to US companies. And actually, uh, so, so this actually caused a very interesting strife between Netanyahu and the Israeli arms industries because the Israeli arms industries were saying to Netanyahu, your populist policies that are turning US public opinion against us are costing us money. But now, just before the, the, the most recent round of elections in Israel, uh, that uh, was, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, Netanyahu uh, forced the government to appro approve two more arms deals with the United States. And these two arms deals for F-35s and to replace the entire fleet of helicopters in the Israeli military are worth billions of billions of dollars. Not one cent of that is financed by the military aid. That's in addition. And uh, this is very problematic because there is no no functioning government in Israel. There is no government budget. He had to bend the rules and take loans in order to finance it. And I think maybe this major arms deal played a certain role in getting the Biden administration to, you know, get just just a big fat bribe to get the Biden administration to oppose public opinion on the streets and to take a, an unpopular position in the United States pro-Israel and against Palestinians. The UN de definition of genocide was written by uh, two Jewish lawyers after, after the Second World War. And part, that's part of the reason that this definition was accepted by the UN, even though anyone who reads that definition would say, well, this is a little broad. Because when we think of genocide, we really think of mass murder. But the, the UN definition would also say that th things like, uh, erasing a culture, changing street names, erasing the history of a people is also counts as, as genocide. If this is how you define it, then of course Israel has been implementing genocide against Palestinians for from for 73 years. But I don't like this definition at all, and I don't think that this is what we mean when we when we use that word. And I think uh, that of course it is scary to to look at those lynch mobs conducting pogroms, because if we think about these lynch mobs and pogroms as something that is similar to what happened in Europe in the 1930s that led up to genocide, where millions of people was, were, were murdered, uh, then, then of course, if we, we, we can just follow that logic. And a lot of Israelis think in, 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 in that uh, association, because that is part of the Israeli education system that uh, is really teaching a lot about the Holocaust, not in a very uh, uh, inclusive way, in a very exclusive way, just the, the Jewish Holocaust, but not the other people who were murdered. But uh, still, that's something that, that this association is a very deeply embedded in Israeli culture and Israeli history. But I don't think that we need to necessarily make that comparison. I think what you said about Serbia, for example, is an, another example of, of a, a, a situation in which ethnic strife between different groups has turned into genocide because one group felt that they have all the power 
and they have the majority and the others could be just swept out of the way if we do it quickly enough. But that's not the case in Israel-Palestine. The case in Palestine is that Jews are already a minority in the country and they know that. And they don't have the ability, certainly not the international legitimacy to go about and just uh, depopulating Palestine from, from Palestinians, not by, for, not by murder and not by deportations. And we're still, I mean, of course, the, the numbers of the dead, uh, uh, the people killed in Gaza rises every hour as, as we're speaking. I, I'm, I'm too afraid to give a number because I'm sure it will be outdated by the time I say it. Uh, but uh, we're, we still have to take these numbers in proportion and remember that it's not the what limits the number of killings in Gaza and also in other places of Palestine is not the lack of bullets or the lack of missiles for the Israeli military. What limits it is the lack of willingness. And that is something uh, very important that the, the Israeli soldiers are not willing to, to commit every crime and they're not willing to pay a price for those crimes. They're not willing to be confronted with international boycott. They're not willing to be banned from traveling to Europe. Uh, and uh, they, they want a luxus occupation, right? They want uh, to, to, to uh, eat the cake and have it too. Uh, and they're not willing to make the sacrifices that the Serbians were willing to make during the Yugoslavia war. So I don't think that we're getting to the point of, a, of genocide quite yet. But I, th I do think, uh, Sheer, that we have a lot of the components that we saw in, in Germany in the 30s um, in place. Um, and it, it, what you said is true I'm, in that there, there is a sort of uh, balance in population between um, Israeli Jews and Palestinians. Um, but, you know, the Israeli Jews do have a massive amounts of power. Um, and inside Israel, the Palestinians are considered a minority. Um, and I, I just feel like we have a situation where gen all the components of genocide are coming together gradually and may not have um, sort of coalesced in a way that would allow the process to proceed in the way that it did uh, in the in the Holocaust, then it may never get to that point. But we sure do have so many of those components. Um, you know, Kristallnacht. If you think about, you know, what that was like for for Jews in Germany, and you think about what it's like for Palestinians. Uh, um, the only difference is that the Jews in Germany were such a minority they couldn't really fight back, and the Palestinians in Israel are uh, not going to go quietly. So there is going to be pushback. Um, but I just, I'm afraid of, uh, of there being too many similarities to 1930s Germany. The basic law of the Knesset that says that candidates cannot run for election if uh, they refuse to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. And uh, I think that is a, an important law to mention because it does mean that Israel has never been a democracy. This law means that uh, that any non-Jewish candidate would say, I also want to be a full uh, citizen of that country uh, is, is prevented by a basic law. And the basic law is, is the closest thing that uh, the state of Israel has to a constitution. It's not really a constitution. But of course, we have, uh, Lubna, you mentioned at the beginning, the nation state law. Nation state law is, is the official name. Nobody calls it that in, in Israel. They call it the, the law of the nation. Uh, and it's a law that was... Um, and it's a very short law, by the way, it's 200 words, very, very brief text, doesn't mention the word equality once, doesn't mention the word democracy once. And it mentions, however, all of the ways by which the Israeli government imposes inequality and apartheid on Palestinians, how Palestinians can never have national rights, they can only have basic citizen rights, not all of them, and that colonization is a basic tenant of the government responsibility, colonization of Jews, it says that very clearly in this text. And a lot of people said, well, maybe this law, the basic law of the Knesset, the, and now the, the law of the nation, they are proof that Israel is an apartheid state, is no longer a democracy and so on. But I think that they are exactly what we're seeing now, this wave of blatant racism. What you said 
Lubna, racism is now open, it's on the table. Because as long as it's possible to hide the racism and to say, well, uh, there's been a, a curfew or there's been an arrest, but it was for security reasons and it's just a, a, a state of exception. And uh, we're not, it's not open policy that Palestinians are treated differently than Jews, but uh, it just happens this way here and there. But, but the law doesn't uh, justify it. If this is the kind of racism that you have, it shows that the Israeli government is still in control and is still able to pretend to be a democracy. And now it is not pretending anymore. It's very, very open and outright with the discrimination. I think it's because it has lost the ability to, you, to exert its power in a subtle way. And the moment where it has to exert its power so brutally and openly, it means that it is no longer sovereign. It loses its power, really. And I think that's one of the things that we're seeing, that uh, the state of Israel is really breathing its last in, in many ways. And it, it could be no, a, 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 a regime that is going to be removed uh, with, within a few short years. I wanted to also talk about the uh, Jewish democratic uh, element uh, here that, that Ashir mentioned. It, uh, the Declaration of Independence talks about Israel as a Jewish democratic state. And I think that um, liberal Zionists have had held that out as their mantra for, uh, for decades and um, seen that as some kind of amalgam of, of Jewish values and democratic values that could uh, inhere in the state itself. And I think that we're now finding that that's uh, an illusion. And that is why the underpinnings of liberal Zionism, which have been so important in diaspora Jewry and so important in American Jewry, uh, are, are gone. Um, the, the illusion is gone. There is no possibility that Israel can be a democratic state uh, as it's currently constituted. Uh, it's, it's a Jewish state. And I, I'm really uncomfortable in a way as a Jew talking about Israel as a Jewish state um, in, in these terms because it's a type of Judaism that I don't recognize. And I grew up in uh, conservative Judaism and uh, I grew up in uh, sort of infused with Jewish values. And so this is a Judaism I don't recognize. And I have a great deal of, prob uh, of difficulty uh, talking about whatever is Jewish in this. And in fact, I like to talk about the, the version of Judaism that uh, Israel is, 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 is um, offering as kind of uh, pagan idolatry and the worship of uh, what I call stones and bones, uh, rather than the prophetic Judaism, uh, universal values that uh, of the Judaism that uh, I think most Jews outside of Israel have, have practiced. Um, but anyway, uh, I think that democracy is really uh, completely gone by the wayside. And that's the nation state law basically sealed the, the doom of uh, any possibility. Israel, you know, wasn't democratic before then, but I think that as Shear said, it's sort of like, um, it, it sort of formalized the fact that democracy was dead uh, in Israel. And so I suppose you can call it maybe an ethnocracy uh, in that uh, Jews as an ethnic group have superior values. Uh, I mean, superior values and also enjoy some democratic rights if they're the right Jews. Um, but uh, um, democracy is dead uh, in Israel. I think we have to recognize that. And I think we have to fight back against the liberal Zionists in the media who are continuing to talk about this as a, as a viable uh, concept and continuing to talk about two states and all the other rigmarole that uh, goes on. Well, maybe we should also talk about the um, the destruction of the media office in Gaza, because I think that goes to um, the ICC investigation. Um, and the uh, Israel destroyed the media offices for many uh, 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 media outlets that were in Gaza, including Associated Press and uh, Al Jazeera. 
uh, and gave them an hour notice to uh, evacuate and then destroyed the building. And I think what's important here is that the AP is demanding an independent investigation of this crime. And um, I don't know enough about the Geneva Convention to say whether the deliberate destruction of uh, uh, attack on the free press uh, is, is a war crime. But I imagine that um, when the Associated Press very decisively demands an investigation, that is really a signal to the ICC to include it in uh, its brief, um, the, uh, the investigation of war crimes uh, going back to 2014. So um, I think this is also a, a kind of a marker uh, that uh, broke uh, many people watching this um, when they realized that Israel would deliberately um, attack the free press uh, because it didn't like the reporting that was happening. It didn't like seeing the videos um, that the world could see of the buildings being destroyed. So um, this may have been a decisive uh, element in, in whatever is going to happen. Uh, hopefully a ceasefire coming, who knows when, but. I think Richard, it's also was confusing because like we also Middle East, I have offices at that building and we released a, a statement uh, about that. But then like Israel using all the time the six use that Hamas is hiding in these buildings and um, whatever yes or no, it will, no, will not be a reason to, to, uh, to, to just destroy the, such a buildings of a press or of any other buildings. And we find ourselves like today as, as a journalist, how you, how you reply to that? What is your, you know, what's your statement against that? How you use like Israel have its own explanation of why they're doing X, Y, Z and, and what, what you will reply for this? Well, the way I always reply is that they're lying. <laughs> because you can almost always assume that uh, when something like this happens, the Israelis are lying. And uh, I always demand to see the evidence. And I think I read some, in some article that Israel has not presented any evidence that there was any Hamas presence. And the AP itself is basically alluding to that by saying they were never told there was a Hamas presence in the building. And I'm sure if the AP or Al Jazeera had heard beforehand that there was a Hamas presence in the building, they would have either uh, have, um, left the building or they would have appealed to Hamas to, to get out of the building. Um, because I do think-, you think they, that Israel will, will, Do you think Israel will shoot and destroy the building of, of the offices of the AP without telling them before that? Oh, oh you mean, uh, yeah, exactly. That's another point. I think Israel would have told the AP and Al Jazeera, you know, there, there are Hamas. So I mean, like if the Americans did know about the bombing that coming in to Gaza and agreed for that. Oh, if America knew that they were going to destroy the building? Yes. Oh, oh I'm sure America knows everything that, I mean, they, they have the NSA um that's that's listening to everything that's going on i'm sure they know exactly what israel intends to do before they're going to do it and i'm sure they could have released a statement beforehand even if they weren't going to say we know that you're going to do x y or z i'm sure they could have released a statement saying we warn israel not to exceed you know red lines and not to attack whatever um and the fact that they didn't it's it's sort of collusion between Biden and the, and the Israelis, uh, whether it's tacit or explicit. Um, so yeah, it's cynical, but I don't think that the, if Israel had evidence that Hamas was there, it would have presented it. It would have presented videos or it would have presented uh, audio tapes. And Israel, the unit 8200 of the signal intelligence unit knows everything that's going on in Gaza. They know every word that everybody is, is saying there, including probably of Hamas. So they could listen to everything that was happening in that building, including whatever the AP was saying and what Al Jazeera was saying. So um, I, I think it's just a, a tissue of lies. And um, and Shira and I were talking about the, the the trickery that the the IDF attempted to lure Hamas into tunnels by claiming to the media that they had entered Gaza about a week ago or so. 
and they hadn't entered and they wanted to see if Hamas would send its fighters into the tunnels. And it was a deliberate lie. And the mainstream media, including uh, she was telling me the German media, reported that Israel had inv invaded, uh, invaded Gaza. But Hamas didn't fall for the trickery. And Israel uh, bombed those tunnels thinking they were going to kill four or 500 Hamas fighters, and they didn't kill anyone. Um, so I think the lesson that should be learned or should have been learned by the media is never to trust anything that the Israeli uh, government is telling them, especially the Israeli uh, military, and, um, and, and that they have no credibility. And anyone who believes them is a fool. Um, so that's what I would, in response to Lumna, that's what I would say. Um, I don't know if anybody's listening to me and saying it, but uh, you know, one of the things in my blog is that I, I track all of the lies that the Israeli uh, military and intelligence apparatus tells about various operations that they're engaged in um, and try to expose them and have a, a, a record of, uh, of this deceit um, that they engage in. If, if I can say something quickly about this uh, discussion we're having about the destruction of the building of AP Media and Al Jazeera and also Middle East Eye, this uh, attack on the media building, I mean, you've, you've both offered uh, different theories to explain how it happened, but I think we find it difficult to explain to find the theories because it is such an irrational thing to do, because what would possibly the Israeli um, the, the state of Israel has to gain from destroying the building. So let me offer a different interpretation for what happened. After all, the, the artillery or the drone that destroyed the building is operated by some soldier who knows one thing for certain. There's nothing or almost nothing they could do that would make the Israeli military investigate their decision to open fire and uh, make them accountable if they kill innocent civilians or if they destroy Palestinian property. So somebody in the Israeli uh, artillery or maybe even in the intelligence and just decided to make this building into a target. And uh, they because they don't like reportings uh, from Al Jazeera and AP about, about the bombing in Gaza, and they never got approval from above to do that. And of course, because the Israeli government uh, has this system where the soldiers are not accountable and are never have to face consequences for these decisions, the, the responsibility still stays on their shoulders. It's still the Minister of Defense who, can, who will have to answer to the ICC or whatever international investigation is going to happen. Uh, I'm not trying to get them off the hook, but this is what happens when the military stops functioning as a military and acts like an angry mob. Every soldier does whatever they want. I, I, by the way, the, the, I saw one of the questions, uh, one of the recent questions in the chat uh, is about uh, people calling for, for joint uh, solidarity, uh, um, demonstrations of Jews and Palestinians together against the war. Uh, and uh, at the very beginning of our conversation, Richard, you mentioned the slogan that has been used so often by activists in uh, um, uh, 48 Palestinians and, and uh, Israeli Jews, uh, um, Jews and Arabs refuse to be enemies. And uh, I just wanted to mention that I've heard from my, my friends in these demonstrations this year or this time around that they don't want to use this a, a, a slogan anymore because they say, imagine we have a, a demonstration against violence against women, you know, against uh, uh, gender based violence. And we say men and women refuse to be enemies. That would, would be obscene. And, and under these conditions, we have to find new slogans for uh, calling uh, uh, for an end to racism. One of the things that I, I wanted to mention uh, in, in light of what you were just saying was this video that I mentioned in, um, in Jaffa, in, in Jaffa, I'm sorry, of um, these Israeli Jews demonstrating um, in this central square in, in Jaffa and then trying to march down the street and being blocked by the uh, vigilantes. Was, it just seemed so pathetic to me that they were shouting Israel, uh, Jews and, and Arabs refuse to be enemies, but it's clear that they are enemies. <laughs> so it's as if they're trying to create uh, 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 some kind of a fantasy state um, of, you know, in our little island here, we are refusing to be enemies. 
Um, and I appreciate the fact that they were walking down the street and they were brave and they were trying to encourage the Palestinians who were you know, in the homes that were on both sides of the streets with their slogans. But it seemed so, I don't know, it's hard to describe. It seemed like an empty gesture almost. And I don't know how you have solidarity um, in, uh, under, under these terms in this situation. When I went to this rally yesterday, I, I, I am a Jew, but, and there were Jews, I should say, at this rally, and there was even a Jew dressed in a religious a prayer shawl, um, more power to him. Um, and I'm glad that we were there, but we weren't there as Jews, that there was no Jew who spoke uh, on, the, on the panel. And I don't really think that that was necessary, that that would happen, but it just feels like right now, how can there be solidarity? I mean, there needs to be, but how can there be? Lubna. I just want to say, like, I, I, I've been receiving a lot of messages from Israeli friends who wishing that this madness end and we go back to normality. And they want to make it like a clear that what's normal for Israelis is not normal for Palestinians. Israelis will go back to the kind of normal of drinking the cafe in Tel Aviv beach and the Palestinians will go back to the to be besieged in Gaza, to be behind the walls in the West Bank, to be class B citizens in 48. And, and this is, you know, we, want, we don't want to go back to the normal. And that's why we, we had the uprising. And, uh, Many Israelis just don't understand this. They they go hide behind the slogans like uh, Arabs and Jewish, uh, as you said, refuse to be enemies, uh, end the war now, make it as if it, as if it was an equal uh, conflict. But there is uh, something else now they, they, they should really understand that this is our rule of how we can you know, speak up and uh, put our reality in the table and not romanticize it as just come and eat hummus and falafel in the villages of the Arabs. And then if we behave not well, and then <laughs> we become the bad ones and uh, the ones who are not grateful. There is now a new generation, there's a new voice and there is no compromise. Well, um, I had thought that this would go uh, for about an hour and a half. And uh, unless anyone uh, has anything else that they want to contribute, this might be a good time to uh, end our panel. Um, uh, Shir and Lubna, is there anything else, final words that you want to say or? I wanted to, I wanted to, to say, say thank that you. There is, one, there is one thing that I, we need to be really discussed, the amount of settlers who came from West Bank to inside Israel these weeks and took part in lynching and beating. They are armed, they are shooting. This is a new phenomenon we, we witness here. I interviewed some of these guys. They feel very relaxed to say that is we should shoot the Arabs in the chest and the head. I have this filmed in a video. This is something um, worth uh, attention and, and discussion in the future. This is a new era of reality here. The, the deputy mayor of Lod, uh, Lod uh, actually called publicly for settlers from uh, Yitzhar, uh, which is one of the most radical settlements. Uh, to come and aid the, um, the Jewish residents of Lod. Um, so, um, you know, he also, the, the mayor called for the army to be deployed. Um, and I don't know if the army has ever been deployed in any civilian area um, in, in this way to put down uh, civil uprisings, maybe since 1966, maybe Shira Lubna know that better. It, but it was, but, uh, but it's a question of, of scale. Yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah, there was a, a border police units also in Jaffa and uh, in other cities. Yeah, but I'm talking about the IDF itself was brought in, which is a kind of adding a different uh, dimension because usually the IDF is dealing with, you know, the West Bank or dealing with, you know, armed. Maybe not everyone who, who hears us today uh, knows that when I say border police, I do mean a military unit. It just has yeah. the name of a police, but they are fully right. armored uh, uh, with automatic machine gun soldiers and yeah, yeah. no police training. Yes, it's yeah. part of the military. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're more thuggish, though, than the IDF. The IDF is a little more refined <laughs> in the way it approaches things. 
But um, anyway, um, th that's an added dimension. Other there. than that, I just want to say thank you for, for this uh, um, meeting. Um, all of what's happening make me feel very uh, hopeful. I feel for the first time that liberation, freedom, and justice is something possible, even in a peaceful way. Uh, I think we need the courage of the internationals to stand with the people in the ground. Um, and yes, that's really thank you, Richard and Sheer, for being here and for everyone who joined us. And um, it's a big thing. Everyone is doing his work and this is a long process and uh, we should uh, keep faith that we will have a better life for everyone. Yes, it takes a lot of patience and a lot of courage for sure, for sure. And thank you, Lubna, for giving us um, um, this unique perspective that you have to offer of being there and uh, witnessing everything while we're kind of observers uh, from the outside. Um, thank you, Sheer. Sheer, I think you may have had something you wanted to add. Well, I, I just wanted to say thank you very much for inviting me and thank you, Lubna, for being here and saying these very important things. And um, yeah, that's that's all I have to say. And finally, I want to thank everybody who is in the audience uh, for coming on such short notice. And I uh, hope that we've informed you and I hope that you can take uh, some of the things that we've been saying and uh, turn that into concrete action um, by contacting members of Congress uh, and anybody, uh, family, <laughs> colleagues, and um, spreading uh, a message that's different than what we're hearing in the media and what we're hearing from our leaders. And hopefully we can provide an alternative, uh, a dissenting alternative. And thank you everyone uh, again and goodbye for now. <laughs>